if Web3 needs to scale to the scale of internet, the only way it scales is through ZK. And we have our all our bets on ZK. The biggest problem facing Ethereum and facing Ethereum's ability to scale is fragmentation of L2s. Because right now we have this proliferation of L2s, but uh, liquidity is not shared between those L2s. State is not easily shared between those L2s. Like users have a difficult time moving between those L2s. What Polygon is building is basically a guarantee of safety for a shared bridge, which allows different L2s to have asset fungibility uh, between their chains. L2s are submitting blocks to the Aglayer, and the Aglayer is proving to Ethereum that all of these properties hold. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Brendan Farmer and Sandeep Naiwal, who are the co-founders of Polygon. Before we talk with Brandon and Sandeep, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit gnosispay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45-plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Sandeep and Brandon, thank you so much for coming on. Sandeep, you have been on multiple times before. Um, so let's start with Brandon today. Brandon, you are a co-founder of Polygon by way of having founded Mer Protocol which was then acquired by Polygon. Um, tell us about Mir. Uh, yeah, so Mir was a, uh, it was an L1 that was trying to use uh, ZK for privacy and scalability. And so we started Mir in 2019 and by 2021 uh, really realized that we did not want to build an L1 and wanted to build in the Ethereum ecosystem. And Sandeep and Mahilo and, and the Polygon founders were you know, gracious enough to, uh, to offer us a, a platform to do that. Yeah, super nice. So, Sandeep, during that time frame, you guys acquired quite a few ZK teams. M maybe let's talk about that for a while. So, so I mean, the other very well known one is MS, but I think there were there were um, a couple of other ones as well, right? Uh, yeah, like the, there was like Hermes and uh, you know the uh, like Mail Protocol, and then. Other was not an acquisition, more of a acqui hire, like was the Facebook's Winterfell project, uh, which is like, you know, which became Polygon Maiden. Even now, uh, you know, we recently finished the acquisition of Toposware, who is also uh, one of the, um, you know, one of the leading uh, companies who are working on this aggregation thesis. And, uh, you know, we have been working very closely on our code base. Uh, and the fun part is like now Polygon ZK is like so deep into the into the whole ecosystem, uh, whether it's like uh, a succinct SP1 building on Plonky3 or 
like you know different different protocols using either directly using the open source code or uh, get uh, you know their architectures fully uh, you know inspired by it so we are already doing a uh, lot of stuff so toposphere was also like one of the teams was working on our code base and thinking about like a more of an aggregated uh, you know future the way we were thinking and it was like it made a total sense to you know bring them in especially related to the type 1 prover uh, that we have and things like that so yeah that has been uh, like a long journey because we are absolutely clear that you know if web3 needs to scale to the scale of internet the only way it scales is through zk and we have our all our bets on zk yeah and i think uh, those were very good bets to place you're kind of bringing a lot of the research you have done over the years together um in this um thing called aggregation layer that you launched earlier this year can you set the stage here so what what's aggregation layer what problems are you looking to solve with it yeah sure i can i can take that um so the way that we see the world is that that the biggest problem facing ethereum and facing ethereum's ability to scale is fragmentation of l2s because right now we have this proliferation of l2s but uh liquidity is not shared between those l2s state is not easily shared between those l2s like users have a difficult time moving between those l2s and so we are scaling ethereum by adding additional block space but we aren't scaling ethereum in the sense that we're not uh scaling access to liquidity and to shared state um like if you think about uh like you know the the value that's bridged to arbitrum that doesn't help uh optimism it doesn't help other l2s it doesn't help the the ethereum l1 and so right now we're in this mode where everyone is basically trying to build their own like mini copy of ethereum where there's sort of liquidity and, and bridge value and defi activity um but we're not able to contribute to uh, ethereum's network effects globally and, and and to contribute to uh to like the overall way that that uh ethereum functions for users and developers And so the ag layer is an attempt to to fix fragmentation on Ethereum. It's an attempt to make it really easy for users to uh, to move state and value and liquidity between L2 chains, uh, so that we can have like a horizontally scalable ecosystem for an execution layer for Ethereum, but one in which we're able to scale access to uh, to liquidity and to shared state. Basically, like a multi-chain ecosystem that feels like you're still using a single chain. Where we have composability and and all these nice properties that we like on L1. Okay, so basically, um, if I kind of take one step back, what you're saying is, say I am a user on Base and I want to do something on Arbitrum. Um, the way that I kind of get from Base to Arbitrum, despite the fact that they are both layer twos on this shared security layer of Ethereum, is by kind of exiting to Ethereum. Um, at the cost of kind of doing a transaction on mainnet, which is notoriously expensive, and then kind of um, moving into the other L2. Um, and there's no way for me to kind of laterally move from base to Arbitrum. And that's what we're fix fixing. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So so it, 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 exactly like you said, like, like suppose that I have some ETH on base and there's like an NFT mint on Arbitrum and I want to be able to claim an NFT from that mint. There are two things that I can do, right? So the first is I can uh, withdraw my ETH uh, through the native bridge on base and then uh, submit an L1 transaction and deposit into Arbitrum. Um, obviously, the problem is that base is an optimistic rollup and uh, it takes seven days for me to withdraw via the native bridge. Um, and then I have to wait for that transaction to be finalized. I have to wait for my deposit to Arbitrum to be finalized. And the L1 transaction is expensive. Um, Some of this gets a little better with ZK rollups because we have a much shorter window where users can withdraw funds. But fundamentally, like it's not good enough. Like we, we, we need a way for users to be able to take their ETH, their native ETH on some L2 and instantly bridge it over to, uh, to Arbitrum uh, and get native ETH um, and be able to do things on that chain. Uh, the second option that users can do is they, they can uh, withdraw via a third-party bridge. So there are third-party bridges that connect different L2 chains. Um, but the problem here is like the trust assumption for using a third-party bridge is much, much different. And there's uh, a requirement for users to rely on liquidity providers and market makers to basically swap from the wrapped synthetic version of a token. So 
let's say I use wormhole to bridge from base to arbitrum, I get wormhole wrap D on arbitrum, and I have to pay some amount of money to swap that into arbitrum native ETH so that I can claim my NFT mint. And so what we can think about the ag layer is doing is providing two things. So the first is asset fungibility. You should be able to take your assets and move them between chains without having to rely on a market maker or a liquidity provider. And you should be able to do this safely at super, super low latency, even lower than uh, like uh, Ethereum block time or, or Ethereum finality time. Okay, I, I understand uh, the goal here. Um, how, how do you make it work? Sure. So this is a good question and, and stop me if I'm getting too in the weeds, but um, what Polygon is building is basically a guarantee of safety for a shared bridge, which allows different L2s to have asset fungibility uh, between their chains. Um, so, so this is what allows us to avoid making an L1 transaction when we move funds. We can just take uh, L1 native ETH and move it between chains and we never have to touch the L1. Um, and the second thing is it allows us to provide this cryptographic guarantee of safety so that chains that are interoperating uh, at lower latency than like even an Ethereum block time, but certainly the time that it takes to finalize an Ethereum block um, aren't at risk of some sort of malicious behavior, like a chain can't equivocate or a shared sequencer can't, um, you know, lie about the messages that are sent between chains. Um, and so the ag layer fundamentally is like this very, very minimal guarantee of safety for the shared bridge and for interoperability. And it provides a foundation for what we call emergent coordination infrastructure. So the way that chains interoperate is up to them. They could use a shared sequencer or a relay or, you know, a builder. And uh, these mechanisms benefit from the shared bridge and the safety guarantees that the ag layer provides. So like the, like, like one case would be for a shared sequencer. Um, uh, if users wanted like synchronous composability between chains, they could opt in to using the same shared sequencer. And that shared sequencer would allow the same block builder to simultaneously build blocks across chains. So uh, a user could submit a transaction on, on one L2 um, to move funds and, and claim a mint on another chain and then swap back to the original chain um, or uh, you know access some key store that's located on a third chain. And the builder could do all of this simultaneously. And the ag layer would guarantee that for all of these chains, um, the builder can't misbehave and uh, asset fungibility is guaranteed. And so that's sort of like the way that we can think about this work. But would that mean that the builder, kind of any builder kind of to, um, to, to build the next block would actually have to opt into all of these chains? So kind of um, I, if, if I want to start a transaction on base um, that kind of bridges to uh, Arbitrum and then back in one uh, in one transaction, um, the 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 builder has to support both, right? Yeah. So 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 this is, I think that that we should emphasize that there are, there are different roles that that exist in this model that that maybe don't exist in the same way for L one, and so it, in the shared sequencer case where we want we have synchronous composability, and, and you know this isn't required for all chains. Chains could operate asynchronously too. Um, but in, in the synchronous case, which is sort of the holy grail of composability, uh, a builder would uh, be executing transactions and producing blocks for all of these chains, which, which sounds bad, right? It, it, it sounds like, oh, like the, this can't scale, like we're, we're, our hardware requirements are going to blow up. Um, but we have to distinguish between the actors that are building blocks that uh, are super sophisticated. They might be running uh, in data centers and and have access to a large amount of hardware. And the validators on L1 that that, that can be fully, uh, you know, ha have very minimal trust requirement or very minimal hardware requirements and can fully validate everything that happens at L2. Um, I think it's up to chains whether they're comfortable with this model in which we have super sophisticated builders that have. That, that are able to operate a bunch of full nodes concurrently, um, but they still exist in this competitive marketplace, right? Like builders are limited in what they can do. They're limited in how they can misbehave uh, in the extent to which they can extract rent. Um, and so I, I, I think we're sort of moving to this world 
where uh, block building is just a, a role and a function that might not be accessible to everyone who's running a node on their laptop or a Raspberry Pi. Um, but I wonder to what extent it's like a necessary step to deliver a uh, very, very good UX, at least for synchronous composability. Yeah, I also want to add uh, one thing on that, DK, like the question you asked from a very simple user's point of view, that if I am, uh, let's say, or in fact a chain point of view, right? let's say there is a transaction where, uh, you know, there is a cross-chain transaction between three different chains uh, and you want to do it in one single transaction. And you can actually break, you know, break it down into two categories. One, where you really want to have it in under one single transaction. That means like synchronous, that we call synchronous composability across chains. And that would require what Brendan was saying, that some level of shared sequencing or like a, you know, a sequencer marketplace where you people are, the chains are selling rights to, you know, sequence the blocks. And then for these cross-chain transactions, somebody who has the rights to all three chains, they, they create the block. But there is another form which is a very much much simpler, which where ag layer is more focused on, uh, and then on top of that, people can build shared sequencing kind of uh, mechanisms. Is the asynchronous composability, where you know if you want to do, if your user, let's say I come to a user which is let's say uh, cannot uh, connected to a chain chain A, and I do a transaction, but that transaction interacts with chain B and chain C, in an async. Ag layer provides you the mechanism or the safety guarantees that that transaction will go through the chain B and chain C and you will and it will come back to let's say some action comes back to your chain uh, but it will go asynchronously it, you cannot guarantee the ag layer doesn't guarantee you that this the entire series of transaction will go through uh, with the same set of conditions that the user initially started with uh, but asynchronously, there are like safety guarantees that the chains are not playing a role in that. If the market condition, let's say it's a, uh, you know, a DEX transaction or something, something changes, the user transaction might or might not fail. But if the conditions are correct, the chains will honor that transaction in an asynchronous way. Whereas, uh, you know, if you needed uh, this synchronous one single transaction and you are guaranteed that the entire sequence of the transaction will go through, for that, you need some sort of shared sequencing and ag layer provides an environment where people can come and build these shared sequencing mechanism. And and we see the world growing into a place where you will have, we will have like, ag layer will have like hundreds or like, you know, not even hundreds, like I would say hundreds of thousands of chains connected in the next five years. Like, I think the space where we are heading into by the end of 2025, only you'll probably have like thousand chains and each application eventually spinning up their own chains, meaning like, tens of thousands of chains and what how we see is that there will be like 90 like a large number of that uh, those those chains connected to the ag layer will be individual sequence chains so you can do uh, you know asynchronous transactions across other chains whereas a few uh, clusters of chains will be shared sequence chains which have much faster and synchronous composability across across the chains and that is dependent on the use case and how those chains want to choose and join one some particular consortiums consortiums and all that is fully dependent on the use cases ag layer is pretty pretty agnostic to that okay so i think there's a there there's kind of like a lot to unpack here but what i'm taking away from this is basically you're you're distinguishing two cases here so one where kind of um the transactions happen one after the other. So kind of say, for instance, I bridge from chain A to chain B, there I swap token X for token Y, then I bridge to um, chain C, buy an NFT against token Y that I really wanted, and then bridge back to uh, to chain A. Um, and then there's the other case where kind of everything, where kind of all the, transaction, all the transactions happen um, at once or they don't happen, right? Kind of what, what I would call kind of an atomic um, transaction, right? So basically you, you bundle everything together. So for instance, if I wanna do, uh, if I wanna ARB something, that's kind of how, how I would w want to do it in order to kind of minimize my own risk, right? Um, and you're saying that the subsequent transactions that is possible today with, with um, ag layer, whereas kind of the atomic transactions, um, that is something that would require shared sequencing, which is kind of um, very much in 
which is optional for chains to kind of opt into. And you kind of see specialized cases coming up where that will be uh, that where that will be done. Is that more or less correct? Yeah, that was very well summarized to me. I would say like the we're we're still working on both the async and the and the synchronous and atomic case. Um, but yeah, I, I I think that's exactly the way to frame it. Um, yeah, I just thought that not to get off topic, but but I, I think this is sort of interesting. Like the ARB case um, that you describe, I I think is like a, a really good example of of when atomicity is is really important. Um, I think it's interesting to like imagine what the world will look like. Like I I I'm not sure that every single chain in the world will be uh, using the same shared sequencer and the same shared builder. Um, but you could imagine like if we're trying to scale DeFi to like internet scale or to like global scale, what that looks like, it, it, it could be, um, a bunch of different chains that all, are all providing liquidity sort of in parallel. And they're all using the same shared sequencer because it's really necessary for, uh, for people trying to arbitrage to be able to do atomic, uh, arms between chains. And, and, and like, it's, it's re- very, very important for us to be able to guarantee like within some slippage parameters that uh, I don't, like b- either both legs of an ARP go through or neither. Um, and so I think like, I I wonder if most of the world um, composes asynchronously with these sort of like DeFi hubs, which are like synchronously connected via a shared sequencer um, or whether sort of uh, synchronous composability becomes important for everyone. I, I, I think it's just there are a lot of open questions uh, as to how the world looks uh, under the ad This is kind of an aside here. Um, I, I want to get back to uh, to the asynchronous case because that's kind of what works um, t- today. Um, but do you think kind of in the synchronous case where you kind of have to have shared sequencing between different chains, do you think it's... it's um, possible to have a composite model where, where you say every other block is kind of um, executed by synchronous um, sequences and um, every other block is done by regular people? Because obviously, um, or at least my concern would be that um, the hardware requirements and kind of the DevOps capabilities needed to kind of run um the hardware behind a shared sequencing setup um, would be very difficult and not achievable for many people. So kind of you would have a small number of entities actually doing this shared sequencing setup, which would result in much lower censorship um, resistance than you would have with a much wider validator set. So do you think it's conceivable to kind of have both where you have like dedicated slots for shared sequencing and then kind of if you want to do something um, atomically, you wait for that slot and every other block is built by uh, independent builders? Yeah, so I, I, I think that's definitely one approach. Um, another approach would just be to like, I, I think implicit in the shared sequencing construction is sort of a, a natural fallback where uh, if a block builder goes offline or, or misbehaves or, or attempts to rent seek, um, chains can always default to allowing anyone to produce blocks for that chain. They, they wouldn't be a sophisticated builder running full nodes for every chain, but it would sort of like fall back to the asynchronous case. Um, but I think that like ultimately it's not for us to decide, it's, it's up to the chains, but I, I do think having like periodic blocks that are produced that are not synchronously composable it is like an interesting solution to sort of guarantee that there exists block produce enough block producing nodes to provide censorship resistance yeah super interesting so let's talk about the asynchronous case so in my head this currently takes the shape as i would almost call it like a unified bridge is that kind of a fair conception of what you're building yeah, so I would yeah, so so I, I I would say that it has two components, right? So so there's the unified bridge, which means that all L1 and L2 native assets that are in the Aglair ecosystem are locked in the same contracts. So all L2s that uh, that opt into the Aglair to have this shared deposit contract that saves us from or saves them from uh, having to submit an L1 transaction every time we do uh, 
asset movement or asset transfer across chains. Um, and so the the interesting thing with the with the async case is like we so so we have asset fungibility and we also really want low latency interop. So uh, right now, like uh, if you want to, we were talking about this earlier, but if you want to uh, move assets between L2s, even if you have a shared bridge, um, there's still this uh, like heavy latency penalty because let's say that I'm on uh, roll up A and I want to move my ETH to roll up B. Um, in order for roll up B to accept the message that's, that transfers assets uh, from roll up A to roll up B, it has to have a guarantee that roll up A's state is finalized. Otherwise, roll up A could equivocate. It could create two blocks, one of which has a transfer to roll up B, one of which doesn't. And it could submit the, the block with the transfer to roll up B to roll up B, and it could submit the block without the transfer to roll up B to Ethereum to be settled uh, on Ethereum. In the case in which um, in which we have to wait for finality on Ethereum, that's a really bad user experience, right? Because we have this like 12 to 19 minute latency delay for, for that block to be finalized. So instead, what we can do in the ag layer is roll up B can declare that it has this dependency on some state of roll up A. So I can say, okay, I, I've received this state of roll up A that includes a message telling me to mint uh, a bunch of ETH and give it to this user. But uh, like, I'm going to, via the ag layer, guarantee that my rollup, rollup B, can only be settled to Ethereum if this state of rollup A is settled. And so if rollup A equivocates, uh, rollup B would just have delayed settlement until it reorgs the transaction from rollup A out of, uh, out of its history. And so, um, so there's this potential for, like, like we're, we're basically prioritizing safety over liveness. And so there's this potential where if uh, the operator of a chain misbehaves or acts maliciously, um, se settlement of rollup B could be delayed. Uh, but fundamentally, this is a necessary trade-off for us to provide super low latency interrupt. Okay. I, I, I think I understand the value proposition. What kind of is missing for me in, in my head is how do you ensure the security and integrity of that ag layer? So kind of where does it check in or does it have collateral somewhere or how does it guarantee all this? Yeah, so it, it proves it cryptographically with the zero knowledge proof. So so like w what's happening is uh, L2s are submitting blocks to the ag layer and the ag layer is proving to Ethereum that all of these properties hold. So the shared bridge is protected and safe um, and uh, chains are interoperating in a way that's consistent and, and no one's behaving maliciously. And so it's aggregating all the validity proofs from every single chain and also these additional proofs that guarantee these safety properties. And it's submitting all of this to Ethereum. And so that's where, where settlement happens. For every block? That sounds very expensive. So it's not necessarily submitting, uh, submitting to Ethereum on every block, but it's accepting uh, blocks or batches from each rollup. And so it's not like... The, the cost of, of aggregating proofs or, or of proving this is like it actually very, very minimal relative to like your typical cost for a ZKVM. So like like proving a ZKVM transaction, which which we do routinely is is actually a lot more expensive than the, the types of proofs that uh, that the ag layer is creating. Okay. But then kind of in between the check-ins of the ag layer into Ethereum, what security guarantees do you have in that interval? Yeah, so so uh, like obviously you are running the risk of um, of some other chain misbehaving or of, of the ag layer misbehaving, um, but I think fundamentally like there's a very small window where this can happen, and the ag layer can never uh, like settle a malicious action or, or malicious behavior to Ethereum, and so the way that I look at it is. Uh, like it's it's very similar to how rollups work now. So so most people use rollups and and rely on like the pre-confirmation guarantee that's provided by the sequencer. So the sequencer basically says like, okay, I'm accepting this transaction at at very low latency. Maybe it's like 400 milliseconds. And for most users, that's fine. They're they're they they sort of have enough trust that the sequencer is not going to misbehave, and they're fine with operating on on that guarantee. It could be the case that certain users are um, 
are transacting in, in large enough amounts or, or like need a further guarantee. And so they wait until their transaction is posted to Ethereum or until a proof is posted to Ethereum. And so like, if you're like selling a house and accepting cryptocurrency or like selling a Lamborghini, you, you just have like a different requirement for settlement um, versus if you're like buying a, a, a low value NFT or something. And so similarly, if you are using a chain that's on the egg layer, you have these different stages of guarantees. So you have the initial guarantee that's provided by the sequencer of your chain. You have then the guarantee that's provided by the ag layer if you need an additional uh, uh, guarantee. And finally, you have uh, the guarantee of, of settlement on Ethereum. And so once uh, everything is settled on Ethereum, it's final. Like the, we know that it's valid. Uh, it can never be reverted. And so I think it's up to, to users to sort of figure out which uh, which assumption, which guarantee sort of fits their use case. Okay. So I understand that the ag layer can't um, settle false transactions to Ethereum, but can it censor transactions? Um, yeah. So so there, there will be a mechanism to force transactions, like to force settlement uh, without explicit cooperation of the ag layer. Um, the ag layer will be decentralized, so there will be like a censorship resistance um, component. But like fundamentally, the the goal is to is is for for chains to be able to use the ag layer with no additional trust assumptions. So so they they should be able to to guarantee that uh, like the ag layer can't censor uh, can't censor settlement of chains for uh, for a long period, and um, you know there are no additional trust or security assumptions from from the chain's perspective. Okay, so who builds, who kind of, who makes the proofs for the egg layer and is it currently centralized? Yeah, so, so the, the initial version is centralized, ju just like, you know, ZK rollups are, are centralized just because, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to do like a bunch of different things and um, I, like building the system uh, sort of takes precedence over decentralizing it. Um, but in the future, it will just be uh, decentralized stake nodes that are, that are producing proofs and... Uh, but but again, like the, these proofs are, are, are relatively lightweight, uh, certainly relative to uh, to a zkVM, and so um, like you know we we use laptops to test uh, proof generation, and and that will be an option for um, for users that are that are producing these proofs. Okay, and so so in in your time when kind of the ag layer is uh, decentralized. Who will be able to generate these proofs? So, who, who will run the ag layer? Yeah, so so uh, stake notes. So so uh, we'll just have a, a leader that that occurs on every ag layer slot, and that leader will be uh, in charge of producing uh, proofs. Okay, who's already using the ag layer? Currently, uh, there is uh, there are four chains connected to it, uh, four or five, and uh, which includes uh, uh, the Polygon ZKVM, OKX is, X layer is connected to it, A star is connected to it. And uh, as we recently announced that we have the pessimistic proof, uh, you know, stage one is getting, uh, you know, built and it comes very shortly, I think in four to eight weeks. Then I think many other uh, stack-based chains will be, uh, able to connect into the ag layer. So, uh, you know, previously near protocol, like as a layer one has also declared that they'll be connecting into the ag layer once they have the ZK, uh, Z ZK was on proofs. So similarly, like, you know, we expect many other, uh, you know, chains and not only new chains, but the existing chains also connecting into it. We, in the next two, three weeks, for example, we also have another, uh, one of the biggest names in the space uh, connecting into the ag layer. So yeah. What's uh, the pessimistic proof? The pessimistic proof. So so this is uh, it's an interesting idea. Um, so like part of the vision for the ag layer is that uh, we're not opinionated about anything. So chains should be able to use their own sequencers, their own tokens, their own governance mechanism. Uh, they should also be able to use their own execution environment. So you should have chains that are able to run uh, a ZKVM, Type 1 and Type 2, uh, the SVM, uh, Maiden, 
um, you know, a move VM, like a custom Rust VM, like basically whatever they want. The problem with this is that if we're using a shared bridge, then for every VM and every prover that we include in the ag layer, the probability that one of these provers is unsound and can be used to generate uh, a proof that that's valid, but, but contains an invalid transaction, uh, goes up. And so this would be really catastrophic because it would allow some chain to construct, uh, you know, a proof that, that verifies, but maybe it, like the block that that proof, uh, is validating includes a transaction that allows someone to withdraw like a million ETH or something and, and they can drain the entire shared bridge. Uh, of all funds. And so we don't want this to be possible. And we, this is like a very, very important part of guaranteeing that chains have the same security using the ag layer, uh, as not using the ag layer. And so what we do is we basically say, okay, from the ag layers perspective, we assume that every proof is unsound, that, that every prover has some soundness bug that's sort of like hidden deep within the code. Um, and so instead we have this special proof. It's very, very simple. And it checks, uh, it, it basically like takes in all of the asset transfers from the bridge and it checks that the, the token balances on each chain are conserved. So no chain can withdraw more tokens than are currently deposited to that chain. And so this guarantees that, you know, I, I, I can't spin up some chain that, that has a prover that I know is unsound and use it to, to drain, drain the entire bridge. And so we call it the pessimistic proof because we're basically assuming that there's a soundness error um, everywhere in, in every prover, and we still want to guard uh, against that possibility. So yeah, so that allows us to provide the same security for chains um, as, uh, as if they were deployed on, on separate bridges. So if you're on Polygon ZKVM, uh, your funds are safe, even if there's some compromised chain that exists uh, elsewhere in the ecosystem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we were talking about different kind of chains integrating into the ag layer. Does this also work for optimistic rollups? So I think kind of we, we've kind of touched upon different ZK rollups, but is optimistic fundamentally different? Yeah, so, so because there's such a long fraud proof challenge period, um, we can't offer the same guarantees because there's no like fast finality that's, that's, uh, that's guaranteed by Uh, by the chain. And so, so the chains that can connect to the ag layer are obviously ZK rollups. And they're also side chains that have, uh, that have finality. And so, 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 so you could say like, okay, um, I'm not going to, to generate validity proofs for my chain. M maybe your users don't care, or, or you think that, you know, having side chain security is a sufficient security guarantee, which, which I think is a valid position. And from the ag layer's perspective, we already have the pessimistic proof And so for the ag layer, like we, we actually already assume that your, your validity proof, uh, is not valid or there's some issue with it. And so we can accept, uh, like a proof of consensus that verifies the security of the side chain. The problem is like, we can't have optimistic rollups because there's no way to offer this sh short interop, uh, period where, where like, like we, we can't, uh, we can't guarantee that like the state of the optimistic rollup won't fork if say the validators uh, say that a particular state is final and then a fraud proof is submitted later. Um, like the ag layer has to be sort of fork free after, um, after uh, like final finality is reached. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the, the big issue with optimistic rollups. Okay. I see. You very recently introduced something called a type one prover. So for everyone like me, not well versed in uh, ZK EVM provers. What does type one mode mean? Yeah, so so Vitalik came up with this classification framework for, for ZK EVMs, and it ranges from type one to I think type four. And it basically refers to like how similar an environment is to the EVM. So, so a ZK EVM is like a special type of computer that's running inside a zero knowledge proof that allows us to verify execution of EVM transactions. And so um, a type four is basically like, okay, this computer is, it's different from the EVM in, in, in like concrete ways, but maybe we have a compiler or something that allows us to take 
uh, existing Solidity code and, and compile it to this new target. Um, and maybe, you know, it's like 90% similar or like they're, they're like, you know, there's some parts of the code that you have to change, you have to re-audit, but, but otherwise it's, it's similar and, and functionally equivalent. Um, type two is type two and three are, uh, are basically like you have an environment, you have a ZKVM that presents a functionally identical, uh, uh, environment to, um, to users and developers. And so you, you can take your Solidity code, you can use it as is, users can transact with the chain with basically no difference from, from Ethereum. Um, but we can't use that ZKVM to prove existing EVM chains. And so that's where type one comes in. It allows us to take any existing EVM chain, whether it's like an optimistic rollup, like the Polygon POS chain, and we can upgrade it to being a ZK rollup. So, so seamlessly, we, we can just immediately start generating proofs um, and we can convert it into uh, a chain that's secured by validity proofs. Okay. Okay, I see. And how does this kind of fit into kind of the the, the Aglay integration? Uh, yeah, so, so it allows us to take existing, like optimistic rollups that already exist and upgrade them to ZK rollups so they can join the Aglay. Okay, so basically this is a way for kind of fixing optimistic rollups such that kind of they are compatible with um, the egg layer architecture then. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so if the uh, type one proof is a way of kind of making an optimistic uh, chain integrable into the app layer, are there any drawbacks for that? I don't understand, like I don't think that there are any uh drawbacks i would just say that when an optimistic chain uses a type one prover then they don't need to remain an optimistic chain they can be a fully validity proven fully proven chain and don't need to have those optimistic fraud proofs which need for seven days to seven days challenge period as a safety mechanism and all those things and they can settle instantly so, you know, when I see of, I think of optimistic chains uh, using the type 1 prover, I am thinking of them upgrading into a ZK uh, rather than like, you know, going along with both of these mechanisms. Okay, so how exactly does the type 1 prover, um, how does it generate proofs for, for these optimistic chains? Yeah, so so it, it uh, you know, it can... Uh, take in what we call witness data from uh, from full nodes and use it to like generate a proof that every transaction in the block is uh, is applied correctly to the existing state of the chain. Um, and so it we can just prove that that a block is valid given uh, a previous state. Yeah, and Friedrich, I think your question is like, how does the type one prover kind of like, you know, work with the optimistic or generate the proof for an optimistic chain. Actually, you have to understand what is a, what is an optimistic chain. Like there is a simple, mostly like I'm talking about EVM chain. There is a simple, uh, let's say, get node, right, which is running somewhere in the chain. And the get node doesn't know anything about optimistic proofs being sent somewhere. It's a simple get node. And then on the Ethereum, you have some few smart contracts, which are the optimistic part of the of the of of the of the whole system, right? And when you create the zk proof, the zk proofs are being created of the chain. Zk proofs don't have anything to do with the optimistic proofs or the smart contracts that they have on the Ethereum blockchain. All that They're, zk proofs are just creating a proof for a get chain, get based chain, or any uh, you know Ethereum or EVM client based chain. And uh, you what you do is as an optimistic chain is like you just simply strip out the optimistic part of the chain and just use replace it with the zk proofs and uh, upgrade it into a zk chain so basically what you do is kind of you um you go back to the last state of the chain that can't be rolled back because kind of the challenge period has lapsed and then kind of you prove that your current state is a valid successor state of that is that correct Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay, cool. What are the challenges in building these? Because it, it sounds like, uh, it sounds too good to be true. So what, what are the challenges in kind of building a type one prover? 
does it only apply to certain kinds of chains? Yeah, so so, so I think the challenges are um, there are a few. So um, like a lot of the cryptographic primitives that are used in the EVM, specifically Ketchak, some of the pairings, they're, they're actually not very friendly to um, to being proven in Israel knowledge proof. And so um, there's like a lot of engineering and, and research work that has gone into uh, making those more efficient. Um, so specifically, yeah, like Catch Act and, uh, and, and pairings. And so um, beyond that, uh, things like uh, the NPT and RLP encoding, they're, they're just not very ZK friendly. Um, but what we discovered was uh, that a lot of the work that we've been doing in R&D in Polygon, so uh, developing Polky 2 and Polky 3, that has gotten us to the point where we can actually accept this extra complexity and cost and we're able to generate transactions for, at, at very, very low cost. And so we've been uh, generating basically a proof for every single Ethereum block from, I think, the beginning of Shanghai or something. And what we've seen is that for these um, for these proofs the or these transactions, the average proving cost is between one and two tenths of a cent. Um, and so this is already like a very, very competitive uh, cost in relation to uh, transaction fees that users are already paying. Um, and we think that uh, that the, the proving cost will, will continue to to decrease because uh, our type 1 ZKBM is, is built on Plonky 2. And when we move to Plonky 3, that will be like a, a huge, huge uh, unlock and speed up. Um, and so I, I think like it's fair to say that we're already there in terms of proving cost. We're just trying to push the frontier of applications where it becomes economically feasible and practical to generate proofs. So, so right now, like everything that you currently do on an L2, I think is uh, is feasible and practical, and, and the cost is low enough to generate proofs for. But if we want to do like games and social applications that that aren't as like economically valuable and and don't have as as high a fee component, uh, we need to further reduce proving costs to 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 make those sort of practical as well. Okay, so kind of the the only reason why kind of type one proofs are feasible is kind of because the um, cost of generating proofs um, has decreased so much that you can now kind of just prove the state of the chain since the last uncontestable state. So let let's talk about these advances advances in cryptography. So you were you 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 were talking about Plonky two and Plonky three and. The fact is like that all of these prover systems seem to have really wacky names. Um, can 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 you walk us through kind of the evolution of CKP systems? So kind of like back in the day, kind of we had we had zk snarks and zk stocks, um, and then kind of these uh, th these come with inherent limitations and challenges that were then kind of counteracted by kind of like polynomial commitments and recursion and so on C can you can you dive in uh, can, can you can you dive into a little bit more detail here yeah I, I I think by by wacky names you mean like brilliant branding and very uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> actually very good names no she, I, I she, she that see that's a reason why we don't put mathematicians in the marketing departments <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I do think the Plonky naming might be like some of the worst branding that's that's ever uh, been introduced to crypto. But I don't know. Like pe pe people, people know what it is, and it's recognizable. But yeah. So, so I, I think if we rewind to 2019, um, so Daniel uh, Lubarov, who is my co-founder of Mir, uh, he and I raised money for Mir in, in 2019, and it was like a very, very nerve-wracking time. Because the primitives that uh, were available for, for, for ZK Tech uh, were not fast enough to do what we wanted to do. And we weren't sure how quickly they would become faster. And so we put in a ton of effort in 2020 and 2021 to, uh, to improving ZK Tech. And our approach was, um, like in the academic community, uh, there's a lot of focus on like um, asymptotic efficiency. So like how many field operations um, a prover requires to, to generate a proof. And this is like a proxy for computational cost and, and latency and, and proving efficiency. But our insight was uh, that not all field operations are created equal. And 
we should have this notion of like hardware and software and theory co-design. So we should look at uh, like which operations can be uh, can be optimized to, to be more efficient on hardware and how that can feed into the theory piece. And so one of the things that we that we hit on was uh, like Fry, which is the polynomial commitment scheme used in Starks, has this nice property that it doesn't depend on elliptic curves. And what this means is that like unlike elliptic curves that uh, that depend on or that require um, very large fields, so at least 256 bit fields, with Fry you, you basically have a lot of freedom in selecting a field that might be much smaller. And if you think about like modern CPUs, they operate on 64-bit word sizes. And so when you're simulating 256-bit field arithmetic, uh, it's actually a lot less efficient than if you had a field element that could fit in a single word. And so we discovered, or Hamish from, from our team proposed uh, the Goldilocks field, which is this field that has like a very, very specific structure that makes it really, really efficient on modern CPUs. Um, and so from there, there, there were a ton of optimizations and a ton of work that went into uh, Plonky 2, which was this uh, like this vision of, of Starks that uh, operate on, on these small, like very carefully chosen fields. And that yielded like a 50 to 100x speed up over what was currently available on Ethereum. And so 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 that's been sort of like the route that we've taken with, with Plonky 2 and, and now with Plonky 3, where we have picked another even smaller field that had like, it was really, really nice on CPUs, but it had this like theoretical drawback where you couldn't, it didn't have this nice property that we needed for Starks. And so Ulrich from our team, uh, working alongside some researchers at Starkware, uh, basically figured out a way to like uh, change the protocol a little bit so that we could use this, um, this really, really nice uh, field with, with, uh, with really nice structure. Um, and so that's kind of been the progression is like, uh, going from the, an academic mindset where, um, we're really, really far from like the concrete efficiency on hardware to more of like a hardware software co-design where we have, um, we have engineers that are working alongside researchers and people on the theory side, um, to, to collaboratively build faster protocols. Okay. So I think I'm missing like a little bit in between here. So, so um, I totally understand kind of how you set your constraints, right? So you, you said, okay, this is kind of the GPU, uh, this is kind of the number of um, CPUs with um, uh, certain specs that are that should that this should somehow run on, and then you kind of you you determine the field size based on that. But how was the field uh, field size size chosen initially? So how how was it d decided that kind of you would need a 250, 65-bit uh, field in the first place um, if kind of like half the size would have easily been enough. Yeah, because for elliptic curves, you need, uh, you're working over a group that that is defined by an elliptic curve. And so in order for that uh, to be secure, in order for the discrete log problem to be hard enough, it needs to have a, a certain minimum field size. You, you, you can define an elliptic curve over an extension field. So you could pick a small field and, and use some higher order extension. But this still like, like the, the, that's not what people were doing. And, and it's, uh, you're still stuck um, doing a bunch of arithmetic in at least a 256 bit sized field. Um, and so with Fry, th there's no dependence on an elliptic curve. And so, so we don't have this minimum uh, size requirement. Okay, and so now the difference between Plonky 2 and Plonky 3 is that you can use an even smaller field, making it much cheaper. So is this the limit, or can you make it smaller still? Uh, so I, I, I think there might be minimal gains from making the field size smaller. So so the, the nice thing about Plonky 3 is that it um, it has a, a small field that also has this really nice structure. It's a, uh, it's a Mersenne prime, which means that it's of the form 2 to the n minus 1. Um, and I think that the further, um, further improvements will come from like on the theory side and on the, like the zero knowledge proof protocol side. And so like d using different, 
uh, polynomial commitment schemes, um, using polynomial commitment schemes with a more efficient verifier for better recursion efficiency. I think that these will kind of be the routes uh, for, for future improvements, not so much improvements on just, just from reducing a field test. What about specialized hardware? So, I mean, this is run on, on regular multi-core CPUs, I assume, right? Yep. So if you were to build like specialized chipsets, would that make it much simpler or more, much more efficient? Yeah, so, so it would. Um, and, the, and there are a bunch of different projects that are currently developing uh, uh, chips that, that support you know, Goldilocks field arithmetic or, or other operations that are, that are used in improving. Um, the, the tricky thing is that some of these, uh, some like FPGAs and GPUs might be like hardware or might be memory or, or bandwidth limited. And so um, you might be able to really accelerate certain parts of the prover. But end to end, it might be it might still be the case that you know things are cheaper on a CPU. Um, but I think that we're seeing a lot of uh, efforts toward hardware improvement, and uh, I think that a lot of these are going to are going to yield um, very significant speed ups uh, in the near future. Okay, so do you remember when Zcash had the bug in the cryptography for the shielded pools? So kind of with all of this very advanced cryptography, the problem is that the number of people um, who really understand it to the core is very small and kind of um, you always you always run the risk that kind of there's a vulnerability somewhere in there that just no one's found yet, right? So I I hear that kind of like if, if you look at kind of like how you set up um, the egg layer with kind of the pessimistic proof and so on, kind of... And, and, I mean, you, you everywhere you're kind of trying to contain the risk of um, introduced vulnerabilities. But if something like Plonky 3 were to kind of be faulty on some level, what would that mean for the system? Yeah, so so I, I, I think this is like very much a top of mind concern for us. And our strategy has been to sort of have a gradual progression of of like governance minimization and and decentralization i think it's really important for zk rollups or, or for protocols that use zk technology to launch with training wheels and to give their systems time to to be scrutinized and and to develop and and to uh you know potentially have formal verification and so i think that we're, we're still like very much in the early stage of this process um, and I think it's important to, you know, we're, we're, we're also doing audits and, and like, we're, we're, we're very much like in bug bounties and, and taking like a, an approach that, that we really want these systems to be scrutinized and, and to be secured. Um, but I think like with a lot of things in cryptography, it's just a, a question of time and we just need these systems to be in production and securing value, uh, in kind of a training wheels mode where, if there is a soundness issue, it can be detected and it can be uh, remedied by, you know, an emergency security council or, or something like that. And so I, I, I think that that's the best strategy because, you know, we, we need like to provide a sufficient incentive or, or, or like a, a, a sufficient level of exposure to systems to harden them. Uh, but at the same time, we can't progress too quickly and, and really put user funds at risk. And so that's kind of the, we're, we're like trying to balance those, those two concerns. What shape do the training wheels take here then? Yeah, so so right now, like for like like we, we can take the zkVM rollup, for example. So um, so like like uh, I think like every zk rollup that currently exists, uh, only a single designated party can provide proofs to this rollup. Um, so so we are the only prover. I, I I believe that this is the case for Starkware and, and for zk sync uh, and for Scroll. Um, there's only one party. That can provide proofs, so that if there is a soundness issue, uh, it cannot be exploited um, by by an attacker. Um, the second uh, training wheel is an emergency security council, um, where uh, if there is an issue that's detected, like we 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 basically run every transaction uh, twice. We 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 run it once to prove, but but we also run it to to basically check that execution is correct and, and that the proof um, is consistent with. With what we're executing in the client, um, and if those two were ever to differ, or if someone were to submit a transaction that 
could potentially cause an issue. We we have the ability to halt the system and to rely on a security council that's uh, the majority is from outside Polygon to address that uh, that issue. And so so I, I think that this is the same strategy as as for the ag layer, where um, you know users are still getting a, a much higher level of security because like we cannot steal user funds because we would have to uh, like exploit a soundness issue or, 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 or you know, prove something that's invalid. Um, but if a soundness issue is detected, uh, like we have the ability to, um, to address it. Okay. So maybe this is a question for Sandeep now. Um, so Sandeep, you guys have put together this very ambitious um, vision of how the future of the internet should kind of look under the hood, right? And it is, it's certainly super compelling. If I were to tell you I had a crystal ball and uh, I had a crystal ball and I could look into the future and in five years, um, it doesn't work anything like that. Um, what do you think the issue will have been? So if this fails, why will it fail? I would say that the, your crystal ball is not paying its internet bill and it's not showing you the correct <laughs> results. <laughs> so use Moss's pay. <laughs> to pay the internet bills of your crystal ball. No, I mean, uh, seriously, I think that, uh, you know, we as a unit have been uh, working on this problem. And many times, like, you know, people come to us today that Polygon is not doing this. And they talk about a lot of these short-term things like, you know, Polygon is not doing this, Polygon is not doing that, this, that, they should do this, they should do that. But... The thing is that for us, the mission has been extremely clear from get-go. And that mission is very simple, that how do we create this infinitely growing uh, Web3 you know, infrastructure, right? Our blockchain network, infinitely growing blockchain. The, you know, if somebody tells me like, okay, this system works for 50,000 DBS, this system works for 100,000 DBS, not interested. We want to build an infinitely growing network, so which can take like even like, who knows, 1 million, 2 million, 2 million, even 1 billion TPS in 20 years, it should be able to take that. So if you ask me that architecture, I don't see, I mean, as of now, like I don't see there, there, there can be an, there can be an alternate architecture, which can achieve this, uh, you know, this infinite scalability while like, you know, also solving from this fragmented liquidity and, uh, you know, user experience and all that. And if let's say that doesn't happen, Aglier is not that, I would say somebody else would be there, but their architecture will be very similar to Aglier. Like something like this will win. Whether it's Polygon's Aglier or somebody else's Aglier, that nobody can tell. But somebody like this will win. Something like this will win. I think those are fantastic parting words. So Sandeep and Brendan, if people want to learn more about this, they kind of dive into the docs and so on, because obviously this was... We, we've barely scratched the surface here. Um, where do they go? Um, how can they start building on this? Yeah, so, so the Aglier docs are, uh, I believe, on on the Polygon website. I, I believe that we're, we will be spinning up a separate website uh, that's Aglier-focused um, that will have the uh, the docs there. Um, but yeah, they're welcome to, to go there. They, they're welcome to reach out to me um, directly and uh, or anyone from our our engineering team and um, yeah, go from there. And I also want to, as a parting way, just want to say that, you know, with this ag layer that Polygon like kind of extends beyond uh, a layer two network. Like, you know, we, I like with ag layer, once the ag layer comes in fully, you can't really, like ag layer is not a layer one or layer two. It's a, it's kind of a meta layer, which allows layer twos and many of them will be simple uh, connected chains who are not even using the layer two validity proofs, but they still can exist in this multi-chain environment. Um, and so, you know, that is that the Polygon transcends this layer two, layer one debate, and then, you know, goes into a place where it can actually support uh, this infinite uh, scalability while using Ethereum as the settlement layer. And that has been our core thesis from day zero. And I think like now we are at a place with Ag layer where we can take it to, you know, more closer to reality. Cool. Super nice. Thank you, guys.
as always, it's been very elucidating. I look forward to uh, having you guys on in six months' time and see what you've built then. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Frederica. Thanks, Frederica. Always nice talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.